to please begin the session. A very good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalyani, my own Kallu, for your wonderful words. It was very kind of you uh, to have said so many good things about me. Now, I'm just wondering if, like, how I'm really going to, uh, you know, like, put it across, uh, word exactly, how exactly. Uh, I, mean, I cannot say what art is. Uh, none of us can. But uh, there are various ways and methods of looking at it and how do we go about it. I will try to speak from my own personal experiences and I'll try to talk about margins, you know, uh, from, uh, you know, by fathoming and looking at analyzing uh, women artists and then we'll go, go on and we'll take a look at the COVID art scenario as well. Uh, now, uh, Maybe uh, I, I want you to like, I, I just have one objective in this lecture is like, of course, by introducing, if not introducing, reintroducing, uh, you know, some artists to you and some artwork to you. I would like you to look at art in a very different manner, a different perspective altogether. Because um, uh, basically, especially uh, during the COVID times, uh, uh, a very significant, a very, very significant uh, movement uh, has begun in our art. And art has actually started speaking from the margins. Uh, uh, till, till uh, you know, some kind of a time, just previous to the COVID, COVID time, like from the Victorian time uh, till 2019, I would say, or 2018, um, art had been a kind of a place where, um, like, Place where uh, people with privilege uh, and elitist art and had a lot of influence. Uh, the entire art scenario had been uh, like run by art galleries. We had a lot of middlemen in between, uh, and uh, you know, art galleries like Sotheby's and Christie's and uh, you know Phillips, China Garden. Uh, there are four or five. Uh, art galleries which in fact monopolized the entire art scenario and they decided uh, what to sell and what not to. Uh, this would be a big surprise to you because during the time of Vincent van Gogh and other painters, uh, you see, I'll be actually talking about paintings and then I'll come to, I'll, uh, I'll dovetail into uh, the art scenario now during the COVID times where murals and frescoes and um, uh, recycling art and uh, installations and photography, everything has actually become so popular and everything has actually become so uh, democratized uh, during the COVID time. So um, I don't want to give away the suspense, but then uh, these art galleries like Sotheby's and uh, Phillips and uh, uh, poly auction centers, uh, they, they had a monopoly. Actually, there was a duopoly uh, amongst uh, Christie's and Sotheby's. They were the ones who decided who should be canonized, um, which artist should be canonized, which uh, artist or which artwork had to be auctioned, and what is the price of the auctioning, etc. So there was this huge industry, um, and this particular industry was a kind of an art market, uh, which was like the stock the stock bro broking center, like uh, what we had Nasdaq and uh, NSE and all. You know, people were actually bidding for art and. Suddenly, certain artistic pieces uh, gained a lot of uh, popularity and importance and everybody, I mean, especially the rich people wanted it. So this was a scenario till now. And of course, uh, you know, in the periphery, you had a lot of uh, other artists working against this kind of monopoly. In Kerala, we have our own monopoly. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, in the Cochin Binali, you can see the kind of monopoly. Almost all the art galleries, you, you can go and see uh, see, certain artists are canonized, and uh, like unlike many literary people, uh, the canonized artists are dead artists, basically. Uh, during their lifetime, very few artists are regaled. And of course, you know, people like uh, Davi Verma and all who were actually born with a lot of privilege, uh, you know, had a lot of uh, weightage in them, and they were, uh, you know, canonized right from the time they were born, perhaps. Um, you know, I have nothing against it. 
Uh, but my personal travails, in fact, or my personal acquaintance with cultural studies came in a horrible class in 1998. I was actually sitting uh, in a, a, a dreaded teacher's class um, who, in fact, uh, taught us this particular essay on ideology. Actually, who was the one who wrote the ideology essay? Um, Althusser's ideology essay. Um, so I was fresh from Trivandrum and I was in Delhi. Um, and I, I was trying to like make a, a heads and tails of what exactly ideology is. And this teacher was a horror. In the first class, I didn't have uh, my textbook and she asked me to go out. She said she's not running a kitty party there. And I just walked, this is my first class uh, in Delhi. And she asked me to walk, walk out of the class. And the second class, I was trying to avoid her um, <laughs> eye contact because she used to ask horrible questions. And if you answer the questions right, uh, there were no right answers. If you ask, answer the question, then uh, she'd humiliate you. And as a fresh Malu from Trivandrum, it was so difficult for me. And, uh, you know, I used to, I, I used to camouflage myself behind others and sit behind others and try not to uh, answer classes and all. So all those tales about brilliance and all in class, the Kalyani told you were absolutely uh, wrong. Okay, because... Uh, as a new research student, so all of us, in fact, uh, you know, get into research with a lot of apprehension, especially if there are teachers who will talk to you in theoretical terms in a very intimidating manner, it becomes intimidating. In fact. Babi, and Babi, then, Babi yeah. can I interrupt you? Since you, yeah. since you chose to co contradict me, let me interrupt you. Many oh, participants sorry. are saying there is some disturbance uh, Probably your fan or something which is not. Uh, My fan to... is ah, uh, oh, it's it makes a lot of noise. Can is I? Is there any off? solution to it? <laughs> yeah, I can always switch it off. But, but then you will it be, be too warm for you? No, no, not at all. It will be warm for me, but it's okay. Oh, no I'm problem. so sorry. Uh, no problem. I switch it off. Are you okay with it now? Uh, am I clearer now? In, uh, of course, certainly you are. Yeah. So, uh, so this teacher, uh, you know, the, the, the second class. Soon after I was uh, asked to go out, she asked me the meaning of ideology. And uh, you know, it was a dense French text. I'm sure a lot of you have read it or tried to understand it. For me, even now, it's a difficult test, text. So uh, then I tried to answer her, saying that ideology is this, that, you know, and she put me down. Then she said, give me an example. And then suddenly, I don't know from where, I said, see, with Raja Ravirama's paintings have a kind of ideology which has national. I don't know why I said it. I did not speak out of my scholarship or my sincerity, but I thought, you know, if, if she was a Haryanvi teacher, uh, a Jat teacher. So in fact, uh, if I, I could like put something Malu, I thought I can escape. But then it was very well taken. And uh, she said, oh, that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, and then she tried to, she knew Ravi Parma much better than me, okay? And of course she tried to help us out with the, so that kind of a horror, uh, you know, teacher, uh, you know, it turned out to be my uh, kind of first uh, guide towards research. And of course, I didn't make her my guide because I was too afraid of her. There I began my uh, first explorations uh, of paintings. Uh, I started working on Ravi Varma for my MPhil. Um, I began it as a child's play because I got a lot of encouragement from my teacher. But there on, um, you know, my entire approach uh, towards painting, um, it just uh, became so different. And uh, uh, of course, uh, while I was working on Ravi Verma, uh, uh, I was less political. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I always saw the nationalism and subversion and uh, kind of resistance towards nationalism. But then uh, while I was working on him, I could also see that uh, I had interviewed quite a lot of people. I could see that he had a sister, uh, Mangala Bhai Tamrati. Uh, of course, she also had the privilege of learning uh, painting those days. Not many women in Kerala would have had that kind of privilege, except mural artists and if there were any. But we do not know the names of many of those people. And uh, then I came to know that most of the uh, most of the background and the landscapes of Rav Verma's paintings were painted by Mangala Bhai. Um, and of course, a couple of uh, paintings, uh, Mangala Bhai's oh. paintings uh, uh, are still extant. And some uh, other paintings which are extant are in 
private galleries. Um, I, I tried to get them, but many of them were not accessible for researchers because uh, the family did not want to expose them all. I wonder why. Okay, maybe they were scared of burglars, but uh, I thought it was a grave injustice made to a woman painter, uh, you know, who was not at all popular, not not much popular, not as popular as Ravi Verma. And most of his landscape and all the finer details in his canvas were painted by uh, Mangala Bhai. That's what uh, they did. So now I want to ask you certain questions. Do you like art? Uh, do you know any women artists? Mangala Bhai, of course, I talked about you. Do you know any women artists or transgender artists? Um, uh, who are the artists do you, you know? Of course, there are 90 of you here or 89 or, or, or 85 of you here listening to me. Uh, I cannot ask all of you, maybe in the chat, you know, perhaps you can, uh, you know, answer. Uh, there's no answer, like you can put up the uh, names. And uh, how many Indian women do you know? And uh, how many women and transgenders? So these are pertinent questions that we have to, in fact, ask. And... Uh, um, have you ever taken a look at women or transgender artists, trans artists? Um, uh, now, do you know uh, any sample of the artists who are practicing their art right now? We are not talking about Da Vinci. We are not talking about Michelangelo. We are not talking about uh, Vincent Van Gogh. We are talking about contemporary people. So now uh, with these questions, I wouldn't want to uh, wait for you to answer. If you can answer all these questions, then definitely, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty well informed uh, in art and you have a kind of in, uh, research interest in art. For others, you know, I would like you to take a look at art from a very different perspective altogether. Um, I want to introduce this lady uh, called Artemisia Gentilis. She, uh, she uh, almost during the time of Shakespeare, she was there. She's younger than Shakespeare, uh, 1563 to 1653. Uh, she had a long life, I mean, quite a long time, life. And uh, my math is quite bad. If I say long life and all, please uh, recheck. Because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it's not real calculation. It's just by intuition. So when I saw the figures, I thought perhaps she has a long life. So pardon me if I'm wrong. Uh, so... Uh, there is this uh, man called Roberto Longhi. Uh, what he spoke about, how, what he said about uh, Gentilici was the fact that she's the only woman in Italy who ever knew about painting color, impasto, and other essentials. And that was so condescending and patronizing a kind of remark. But that's all what we know about her in 1916. Because you had stalwarts and canons, you know, like... Um, uh, Boccaccio and uh, Da Vinci, of course, um, the most acclaimed painter uh, that the world knows, and everybody knows Da Vinci. Even my students, you know, who are science students, uh, know about Da Vinci because Dan Brown has popularized him much more. And then, of course, Michelangelo and all those paint painters, and all the world knew. And uh, we, Malu, we Malayalis, we know Ravi Verma. And if there's a beautiful woman, we always refer. Uh, that woman as Ravi Verma's muse and uh, all kinds of stuff, right? So uh, this man, well, you know, of course, talked about Artemisia. And of course, in 1970s and 80s, the feminist scholarship had unearthed her. In fact, uh, studied about her in much more detail. And of course, they've come up with, uh, they've, uh, of course, of course uh, you know, Artemisia, was also from the privileged class because her family was full of uh, full of artists, her brother and her father uh, and her cousins. And uh, so uh, she uh, became successful, a professional, you know, later in her life because there was a trial and there were these paintings, you know, uh, which she painted so boldly. Um, and then oh, she also received commissions uh, from, um, from many kings, kings of France and Spain and England. And of course, she received the patronage of the Medici family. The Medici family, as you know, were the 12th century bankers who were there, you know, who, who dominated their financial uh, trade scenario of Italy, um, uh, especially Milan, Florence, and other small princely states, uh, Naples, etc., for a long, long, long period of time. Uh, for centuries, in fact, they were the first bankers in the world. So, uh, and they were very fond of patronizing. So she got all those kinds of patron patronage. And her father, Orazio, Orazio was a painter too. And uh, she lost her mother when she was 12 and she started painting. Her father started, uh, uh, you know, to teach her lessons and all. 
Uh, and then, you know, uh, at the age of 15 onwards, she started showing some kind of exceptional skill, especially in painting nudes uh, without much inhibition. See, uh, painting nudes, but the nudes have a history altogether. See, this is how you go into cultural studies. When you actually talk about Artemisia painting nudes, then you have to look at the, we have to look at the history of uh, nudes. Nudes were painted, of course, in India, we have an entire history of, uh, especially the ancient history of um, nudity, uh, sexuality and sensuality. Uh, now uh, we do wrap everything up in uh, the kind of um, uh, sugar coating of spirituality. Of course, uh, sex was also spiritual, perhaps at that time. Um, maybe there was no, this, not this kind of a duality present, but then uh, in Europe, uh, nudity was perceived in a very different fashion. Um, the first uh, people who ever dared to uh, uh, experiment with nudity were the Greeks. In, uh, in, in 1982, uh, there was this, uh, uh, there was this I, I forgot his name, okay? Thanks to my memory, I cannot tell you many of the names. Uh, and there was this uh, scientist um, who found some bronzes under the sea. These bronzes were called the Ruyanche bronzes. And uh, once these bronzes were in fact dug out from the sea, uh, you know, uh, they were taken out of the sea, uh, the entire world was shocked because uh, the Ruyanche bronzes were the bronzes of uh, male nudes. And these male nudes were very athletic in nature, the military in nature, and they had this kind of a perfect idealized human body, male body as such. And this male body, uh, you won't believe it, our entire concept of six pack came from, uh, actually it was in 1972, this was discovered. In 82, this was displayed to the world. So our entire concept of uh, six packs and all, I know Kalyani and all, and, and I, we were, when we were growing up as children, we didn't know, have any idea of what exactly six pack was. Only later in 90s, the six pack ideas came. But when you look at into the history of it, Rianche bronzes, if you ever see, if you can ever take a look at, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, some kind of video, YouTube video, you should take a look at the video because they are spectacular because there's, there's hyper-realism in it. There's an exaggeration of realism in, uh, in those Greek sculptures. And these sculptures were uh, sculpted uh, around, these were not paintings, were sculptures, uh, sculpted in 5,000. BC, 5000 BC to 3000 BC, that's such kind of time period, uh, which was supposed to be the golden period of Greek civilization. And uh, Brianche bronzes had this male body carved and sculpted and chiseled to perfection. So you had every vein intact, had every muscle, you know, totally put inside, uh, you know, totally packed together. And you also have something that is exciting, the posture of the entire thing, which is called the contra posture. That is a co contrary posture. That is, you can see it in, uh, if there are dancers, you'll understand what I'm saying. You have the dvibhangi and the tribhangi, right? The body can be, uh, you know, uh, stylized in such a way that you have three or four contouring of the body. Vibhangi is the, uh, the, the the dual count contouring of the body. Your uh, your your torso will be in one place and your hips will be in uh, other, other place. Uh, and tribhangi is like your head and eyes in one place, torso in one place, and your hips in another, uh, and limbs another. So this kind of a contra posture, and it's very difficult to, you know, unless you're really, really athletic, it's so difficult for ordinary human beings to um, achieve that kind of contra posture. Contra posture. Um, now, um, so this, uh, was it like yeah somebody raised the hand but you know i have a lot of things to say so can can we make the discussion towards the end of it or else you know i'll miss out on things now that was a that, those were the first the news at the end Bobby. yeah uh so th that was th th those were the first news Stay put, everyone. She'll be back.
must be a power failure or something. Welcome back. Sorry, sorry. I had a, I have this uh, trouble in the evenings. Okay, so I'm both on Wi-Fi and hotspot. If one thing doesn't work, the other thing will definitely work. Uh, thank you for your patience. So uh, the Romans were like okay with uh, all the bodily flaws, flaws. But still, Please share uh, your screen. Pardon? Please uh, sh share your screen. Oh, sorry, I forgot about it. Sorry. <laughs> so. Um, and then, uh, but still, uh, there are no female nudes, okay? I mean, a couple of female nudes are there. There's a young girl from uh, Dora or something, a couple of female nudes. I mean, a lot of things are actually lost. So, but still male nudes were the kind of, uh, uh, were in, uh, in fashion. Can you really believe it? Um, now, then what happened, uh, you know, consequently with that you had the Christian era. I would say uh, the medieval times, you know, with the fall of Rome, uh, a new uh, kind of uh, new art forms took place because a new religion was becoming famous. Uh, in the beginning, it was a persecuted re religion, but they, then, uh, you know, you know, later, uh, out of persecution, you know, uh, maybe thanks to a lot of martyrs, became very popular. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, during the Christian times, what happened was that in the Bible, it's actually forbidden to uh, talk about, to represent human bodies. But then the Roman art and the Greek art were so famous that, you know, there had to be some ways to, in fact, uh, propagate art. Uh, so uh, everything became abstract, you know, symbolic. Uh, Christ was a fish and there was these crosses and there, was these, there were these thorns and things like that. And the kind of direct representation of human body was not really encouraged, not really done because, you know, most of Christianity, especially the con conversion to Christianity happened in tombs, you know, those catacombs, you know, those rolled up tombs, uh, burial grounds. And um, they had done it all in very insidiously uh, in a very hidden fashion. And of course, uh, they did not want this to be out. So lots of symbolism and abstraction crept into and that uh, and of course, uh, there is also the sinful element of not representing gods of body as such, but bodies were represented in, in Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were basically nude people, but nudity was shame then. You know, suddenly Christianity had another interpretation of nudity altogether. This was not the site of uh, this was not the site of uh, pleasure. Uh, or sensuality, but then it was like, it was a site of guilt. It was a site of shame. All right. And then, you know, in, only in the Renaissance, you know, uh, you know, all these people, all these Italians started uh, relearning the classics and they revived nudes. And of course, more than male nudes, uh, there are a couple of Davids by um, uh, one David by uh, Michelangelo's Davids there. There's a sculpture and there's more, one more David, famous David, I forgot. Um, like much before Michelangelo, it was, uh, uh, it was sculpted. Uh, so a couple of Davids and all that, but female dudes became so, 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 so popular, uh, you know, um, uh, that's you. I, I, who was the one who painted uh, the birth of Venus? The birth of Venus is supposed to be the first nude painting in uh, the Renaissance era. Um, I forgot the painter. Sorry, uh, please do check up. Uh, Whenever I have these memory lapses, if you're interested, you can definitely get back uh, to them. Now, uh, and here is this woman, in fact, uh, painting nudes. Um, and you have more nudes coming up. You have the Cleopatra's nudes and stuff like that. And this was difficult because, well, first of all, women were uh, taught painting uh, only in the closed uh, arenas of their homes. And two, uh, fathers, brothers, husbands, they were the ones who actually taught these women, of course. They, for uh, Artemisia, there was a tutor also, we'll talk to talk about them later. And then what happened was that uh, um, now many of the women, like uh, Mangala Bhai and all many of the women did, did the background work, the boring work, right? Uh, you know, etching out 
uh, trees and you know uh, the foliage and flowers and stuff like that in the background the main figures were in fact um, uh, painted by fathers brothers and all but this woman's like was bold enough to in fact and she was precocious in fact from a very young age she started painting and this is one of those paintings which is like very very uh, symbolic in many ways this is a kind of biblical story of uh, Susanna, uh, Susanna uh, and the elders, 1610. This girl was hardly about 18 years old, 15 to 18 years old at that time. Again, I checked my math, but I know she was very young. And then there are these elders who take, a, this is a biblical story. She paints a lot of biblical stories. She had painted a lot of biblical stories. And there are these two young, two elder people, you know, taking a look at uh, Susanna taking birth. And Susanna is like not very happy about it. She's distressed. She's perhaps annoyed, and she's defensive about the entire thing. And um, of course, uh, these elders really uh, spread a lot of rumors about Susanna. And later, you know, uh, Susanna is found to be uh, innocent. So uh, you can see uh, again so much, so much of these. This woman was in fact painting the nude, and nude female body, and. Uh, Another point to be noted was that the fact, noted was the fact that in 16th and 17th century, till 19th, 20th century, women were also not given a glimpse of nudity uh, in art schools. Art schools began 18th century in Europe, uh, but even otherwise, you know, they were not given an access to um, uh, to places, public places where they could, in fact, copy bodies or anything like that. So there were a lot of taboos against women, uh, you know, especially working on explicit things. And Artemisia was quite uh, bold enough. Of course, you know, she had the privilege of her uh, uh, brothers and uh, father and of course, uh, fame also, you know, she was becoming popular uh, because of her talent and of course, privilege too. But then something happened when uh, she was hardly 18 years old. She had this, uh, uh, she had uh, this master, uh, this artist called um, Tassi, Augustino Tassi, who raped her, and uh, she was quite distressed about it. And after uh, nine months after she was raped, uh, she reported it. Actually, she was working on a mural, a fresco, uh, uh, with Tassi, and she reported the rape. And she reported the rape, uh, you know, like in like nowadays, Europe was like present, uh, India in many ways. Right? It was actually, uh, uh, you know. Um, Artemisia was actually put on trial because they wanted to find out if she was telling the truth and they used thumb screws, uh, you know, to try to, they tried to pluck out her, her nails, etc. And then to, to bring out the kind of truth, this uh, thought under torture, you know, uh, truth will come out. Of course, uh, uh, Artemisia stood by her, uh, stood by her uh, charges, okay, by, uh, by the right, rape charges. Now, uh, this particular rape, uh, uh, Tasha was put in jail for a year, thankfully, Cassie. Uh, he was put in jail for a year, and uh, that was a big thing those days, okay? Um, otherwise, he would he wouldn't, would never be, have been, uh, uh, you know, implicated at all. Now, many people think that it's the rape that changed Artemisia's uh, 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 visual language, uh, her, her painting techniques as such. Now her works, but then afterwards, a continuation of the Caravaggio movement, and they also try to bring in a lot of gender complexities. So uh, when you look at her paintings, you know, it's, it's not very easy for you, for us to, in fact, understand if it's a female painting or a transgender painting and, or a man painting, but the techniques, but the context, definitely, you know, there'll be a lot of gender written into paintings as such. And Artemisia was, quite smart at, uh, at bringing it up. So this, uh, this is one of those, uh, uh, you know, first paintings, like uh, uh, her, her early paintings, where Artemisia, it's like uh, you know, her, her Cleopatra, her nude. Um, I mean, after her death, had her relaxed death posture. And now this is one of her most famous paintings, she, which she, she had painted twice. And this is Artemisia's Judith and Holofernes. Holofernes' story, all of you know, he's, he was a king who invaded uh, Judith's place and he raped Judith. And at night, what happens is that Judith uh, kills Holofernes, set versus dead, and uh, both Judith and her, uh, 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 her maidservants, they, 
they, they, they uh, take his head out, a severed, severed head out. And but then this particular painting is famous for the fact that there's so much of violence and revenge, which is actually written into it. OK, and she was also repainting Caravaggio's version. A lot of people have uh, painted um, uh, uh, Judith, but not with so much of uh, so much of revenge in it. There's so much of struggle in it, so much of anger in it. There's so much of violence in it. And this is where, you know, her, her gender in this particular paintings become prominent and it becomes pertinent for us. So uh, this is one of the most violent image of the Judith story. And every time I look at it, I, I get some kind of a pleasure to looking at it because in the 17th century, you know, uh, they were the, uh, you know, she didn't even become sub subversive. It was an, kind of an open statement uh, uh, of revenge. And this is her, um, she had also painted a lot of uh, self portraits. And this is going uh, fast here because self portraits again it has, she has that kind of defined look, okay? Usually when women, women port paint a lot of self portraits, you know, except people like Freda Kahlo, uh, most of the women when they paint portraits, self portraits especially, they look away, they look into the mirror, or they look into the canvas painting it. But then they are, here you can see, like in Freda Kahlo, uh, Artemisia Gentilesi looks at you with a lot of defiance right on your face, say, daring you, dare try to suppress me and you will get it back with my painting. So um, she, she had actually painted it with her first child. And there's more to it. Like, you know, we can actually write her one thesis on uh, every painting of us because you have the color contrast you uh, you know in different periods you know there's a muted color out here um, there's a darker tone and here you have a, a, a more of a vibrant tone strong colors are there blue yellow red the primary co colors are there and she has also used something called chiaroscuro chiaroscuro uh, it was a technique um, uh, where uh, the contrast of light and darkness were used um, so the light falls directly on the object and the entire background is uh, quite dark so that the subject becomes quite prominent and uh, the, the contrast also becomes very prominent. So she had used uh, these techniques. Of course, she was not the uh, kind of um, inventor of uh, chiaroscuro. You had Da Vinci and all using it, uh, you know, much before. Um, and here you have the second time Holofernes is painted. And this time it's like more brutal. Uh, and um, like uh, Artemisia, not Artemisia, sorry, Judith is wearing a uh, brighter color. And uh, the, Artemisia was also a painter of drapery. You look at the drapery, the folds, you know, the colors, the folds, you know, the kind of concentration, the disgust, and the kind of determination that's on her face. Uh, uh, so these are the contrast, the two, two Judiths here. This is an older version, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a young, I mean, this is the first version, the second version. And here you have a younger uh, uh, Judith and here you have an older Judith. So you can see a kind of self-reflexivity. Um, and uh, on this particular painting, on the second painting, you can see that there are so many blood drops, okay, on her breasts and her, uh, you know, dress, it seems, you know, have drops of blood. So there's more violence to it. It's more gory than uh, the first one. Uh, so I'm going through this and you still have more paintings of uh, biblical heroine uh, here and you have the second painting of uh, you, you see uh, uh, this is like Susanna's painting and uh, this passiveness is quite unusual maybe it was one of those phases of her life yeah this is again another version of Judith where uh, Judith and a maidservant their hand in glove the two women you know conspiring against the wrongdoer and just eradicating him altogether. All right, and uh, they're hand in glove and they conspire. And there's a kind of a strange friendship uh, that's besides class, uh, but it's a kind of a gender kind of friendship, uh, which is uh, complicit in its revenge. Uh, all right, um, and this is a satire, Corsica satire story. Uh, I, I do not know much about this, okay? But then I wanted you to see uh, the contrast here. This is the Susanna and the elder uh, sto uh, story again. Uh, defensively, Susanna has actually put her hands, uh, you know, uh, and asked the uh, and she asked the elders to stop there. And the story of Lucretia. This is again important because Lucretia was raped. Lucretia was raped 
by an Etruscan prince, Etruscan king. And Lucretia, in fact, kills herself because, you know, her honor is violated. And but she asks her, her relatives to take revenge. So it's not the revenge of the woman, but then, you know, she makes sure that, you know, revenge is taken and then she goes. So th th this kind of dominating rape theme, the dominating kind of violation themes are there. And, um, you know, Linda Nochlin in her famous, uh, there's this famous uh, essay by Linda Nochlin, where she says, where, are, where have all the women artists gone? Uh, she yeah yeah she she says that you know perhaps this is also a kind of patriarchal infringement into her artistic uh, freedom of course there was physical violation but there was a kind of psychological and mental violation as well you know in almost all these paintings so the etruscan prince and his uh, you know uh, moorish uh, you know servant again they're complicit in their male bonding uh, of violation and then they rape her of course, she takes revenge, if not directly. And again, you have the Judith and, and the, 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 the uh, maid servants, the maid servants, yeah. Very attention to details, her curly hair and her Moorish look and her class, the, the difference in class. It all actually packaged in chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro spelling is there if you want to check and write down. Um, and this is a self-portrait. So I'm just going slightly uh, ahead in time. And then, of course, there were a, a, other, some other Renaissance painters also. Uh, a lot of paintings attributed to these women, but uh, I'm not going into detail. But uh, another painter, you know, Mary Cusat, Cusat, sorry. Um, uh, she's both an American painter who painted from 1844 to 1926. And uh, she was an impressionistic painter. Uh, I know, I think you know what impressionism is. Till now you saw smooth uh, canvases, right? Everything was blended together and was so realistic. And here, you know, you can actually see the brush strokes. So this small, uh, you know, rapid uh, brush strokes, uh, which are dominant in a painting uh, is what uh, that makes impressionistic paintings impressionistic. So, um, uh, Claude Monet and there were other painters who, in fact, uh, even uh, this thing, uh, Vincent van Gogh to a certain extent, they were the ones who, in fact, uh, dealt with uh, Impressionism. They never used black. For black, uh, if they wanted to use black, you can see black pigments here, right? Um, they used to mix brown and ultramarine blue that made it black, or purple, brown, and purple, burned umber, and ultramarine blue. So that mixture would bring black. So they never believed in using black. That was one of their um, uh, mantras. Okay. And then you have uh, these rapid brush strokes all around. I can actually see them so distinctly. And it became a kind of movement altogether. And here you have her daughter. Uh, sorry, this is a self portrait. And here you have her daughter, Cassette's daughter, relaxing with a uh, is a cat or a dog? Not very sure. And you have uh, a woman trying to stitch in her domestic duties in her garden. Uh, this is uh, painted in Japanese style. Japanese style because, you know, during that time in the late 19th century, oriental styles were becoming popular because of uh, Chinese and Japanese art, uh, which are two-dimensional in nature, uh, which had a clear outline. You can see the outline here, right? So even now, you can see lots of uh, Japanese paintings like that with uh, a kind of floral uh, backgrounds, etc. She was actually experimenting with them. And this is like the bath. Perhaps a child was given a bath by the servant or mother. We do not, I, I am not very sure about it. Um, this is an outing, the summer times an outing. And you can hear again, you can see um, uh, impressionistic uh, marks out here of uh, the waves, the ripples and the waves etc. Um, this is an outing and there's this child in this uh, lovely headgear and flowers and etc. Um, again, mother and child. What you can see, this is again a summer of time. Uh, uh, Monet was a famous artist like Claude Monet, who in fact painted um, lilies, water lilies, uh, with this almost the same. He um, uh, uh, was one of those innovators of uh, Impressionism with almost the same uh, water strokes. In water, you have all kinds of colors. You have orange, you have purple, you have beige, you have yellow, uh, all kinds of colors are there. Except black, you know, they just used colors left, right, and center. And you have green and you have blue. 
uh, they have almost all the colors in water. And these uh, these colors were not really the bold colors. They were muted colors. They were um, they were the uh, they call it the cooler tones. Okay, the cooler tones of um, of colors were used as well. Now, uh, what was actually uh, important out here was that a lot of domestic scene uh, scenes were painted and paintings from the real life experiences of the artist and uh, you know gender was sort of projected through the kind of uh, you know close close proximity with domesticity as such now uh, uh, i would like to just uh, skip morisot who's another painter painted uh, for a brief while around 40 years 50 45 years um, Morris said what's important was that, you know, her life was like, uh, she tried to live a very calm life, etc. But uh, she was never given an opportunity to again, you know, paint in public. She resisted, she questioned it, but then she was never given art classes. Um, she was never, uh, uh, you know, uh, allowed to uh, paint in uh, museums or in, uh, in, in those schools, artistic schools, which are male dominated, basically. And then afterwards, you had the famous Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, she was a very famous uh, uh, artist during her lifetime. But in the beginning, you know, she had her own struggles. And again, she had a long life. Now I can see she lived uh, for around 99 years. She had a long life. But in the beginning, her life was a struggle because people actually dissed her painting. She painted something like this. Like this. This is American South West. Huh. This. Now people just wondered, what is this woman trying to say? What exactly it is? Uh, but then, um, what? Uh, it's only, it's only, it's only later, you know, they understood that she was actually talking through very, uh, very simple symbolisms. Okay, that she was actually talking about uh, plus. She was talking through flowers. She was talking about flowers. She was talking about fruits. She was talking about uh, the conch shell or a simple shell. So there was something they thought, uh, the first of all, the critics, you know, they started uh, noticing her. They thought uh, there's something really childish and very uh, insignificant about her. But later, you know, uh, and of course, you know, her flowers and apples and avocados and all, you know, had all those curves and sensuality around it. So they also thought perhaps there's something more to it. And this particular bone-like structure that we have seen that uh, uh, the skeleton of this rocks or something, the bones were in fact uh, beautiful because it had their apertures and cavities and, um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, a lot of roses were tucked inside. And it had all these impossible, impossible uh, kind of simple symbolisms, and um, and the color scheme was also mo monochromatic. Monochromatic means you use only four or five colors out here. You can actually see that have whites here. Okay, you can uh, see creams and grays, and uh, uh, yeah, that's it, black. So almost the same tonal. Uh, there was you no know, this striking contrast, as in, um, and of course. Then, and she was known for this painting class. You can see this is Iris. Um, then you have this blue morning glories. Uh, and uh, she tried to give you a close up of flowers. And these close ups, in fact, uh, give you a different perspective altogether. Uh, she forced every viewer to look at the flower from a different view, point of view altogether. Suddenly, you'll be seeing uh, the moon. We, we also have this. Uh, this thing, this flower, uh, you know, in our yards and things like that. But O'Keefe gave us a very different perspective. Um, the two gins and weeds uh, and the striking uh, poppies, oriental poppies, red poppy, Sakana, red kana, 1928, and Jack and Pulpit. She painted five or four or five times, purple petunia, kala lilies. And flowers, 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 flowers everywhere. And the first flower that you've seen is uh, the black iris, was the most famous. Where is it? Let me show you. That bit. Yes, this is a black, black iris, the most famous painting is black iris. Why was this woman, you know, painting silly uh, flowers all the time? Now, uh, 
she had an affair with uh, an artist stylo or somebody who cheated her a couple of times but they were together for a long time uh, stylo was a, a famous uh, painter so uh, he started patronizing her in the beginning all right and then later she got her own name and later you know now every uh, now a lot of studies have been there in analyzing these paintings and they say that these flowers um, are just not flowers they are perhaps women they are perhaps the vaginas the sexual organs black eyed is definitely different kinds of vaginas different kinds of reproductive organs and the celebration of it perhaps it's a kind of a, an implicit celebration of uh, female fertility so uh, there are so many theories uh, to it uh, and uh, you know, there's a kind of defiance in that also you see you don't paint the vagina directly but you paint uh, the sexual reproductive part of a plant and you celebrate it so uh, that is a subversion that you can actually find in georgia o'keefe and now she's so famous like but in the beginning you know um, she had faced a lot of criticism and people were dissing her they thought sickness insignificant and frida kahlo you all of you know because of the mexican exotic self portraits that she had uh, painted for herself as you know she was married to rivera diego rivera who was also another famous artist now uh, and her paintings of her self self portraits as well as her portraits of diego rivera are very famous because because uh, she paints rivera she sees him like uh, for her paintings were kind of personal political statements on uh, the institutions of marriage on uh, the institution uh, on fidelity on artistic uh, popularity on art- artistic freedom etc so here you can see um, the squinted eyes of um dego which was actually highlighted because uh, there's a lot of criticism out here okay you can see that he's not looking at her directly he's looking away and there's something uh, there's something that he's hiding there's something that uh, you know um, and he also doesn't have a very pleasing face he's like he's he's hiding something or he's disgusted with something or he's not very happy about what is going on uh, or on him being under the gaze of uh, um this lady uh, so these are their portraits again the portrait comes the wedding uh, this is a wedding portrait and you can see this is the difference between these two uh, artists all right we have rivera who is a huge uh, strong man and he holds the easel and brushes she's just a coy docile woman you know she she holds her shawl and she just uh, lays her hands on his they're not even holding each other but it's a kind of an arrangement that that me so this is painted 2 years after marriage so in almost all carlos paintings you can see heartbreaks and sadness and loneliness and of course plenty of honesty and this anguish and joy and loss and and this is like soon after uh, as you know freda was also uh, dogged by a lot of illnesses she had um, polio at the beginning and then she had a spinal injury due to a bus accident and uh, you know she was laid up for a long time and she painted a lot of paintings so, you know laying on her bed eating all her pain etc and this is like one of them like she is the doe she is a uh, deer so like hunted down by a lot of uh, arrows of the society it can be an artistic arrow the marriage uh, this thing uh, uh, you know for physical illnesses or psychological bruises you know uh, so she just tried to put Uh, they thought it was so eccentric you know they did not understand why she was actually painting and this particular painting and in others also can be a lot of uh, um like uh, animals are used as symbolism and uh, she becomes the animal and animals are used as symbolism so this is a very famous portrait of uh, my dress hangs here and everything out here see i am only talking about the painting inside but uh, while you look at the painting uh, you also have to look at the external kind of facts you know what is the what was the political situation for perhaps of mexico i cannot go into all those details and depth in depth because i just wanted to give you a kind of feel of paintings and i have you know even after hearing this uh, listening to this a couple of you at least should go into painting look at paintings in a very different manner altogether and i'm sure you already know but then let's go a little bit a, little, a, a, a small trigger Uh, so between there's this closet and there's this trophy so uh, and her life hangs in between the two 
So uh, it's a kind of shitty life, right? And how life is like hanging between the two. And there's a kind of black humor. And this will really interest, you know, the literature students here. Um, there's plenty of black humor. There, you know, it's like she's laughing at herself in her plight and she's just exposing it to the world. And here she is, you know, in the middle of uh, ruins. Um, you have an abortion at the particular time for because her, her spine was all crushed and she was having a, a, a terrible, terrible time. And she's in between a lot of ruins and she's looking at you and that here I am like a doll. I'm posturing right in front of you, but, but I have all kinds of ruins. You have, and there's also this clash of tradition and modernity out there. You have perhaps the birth of factories are there, the birth of, uh, you know, machines and uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, industries are there, uh, and then you have the ruins of an older, uh, older world altogether on the one side. And here's the bride, and uh, she's got a third eye, and the third eye is her husband. So, so there's a there was a stormy relationship. So there were a lot of uh, betrayals, and there was a lot of love, and um, of course uh, there was also uh, uh, the feeling that you know uh, Diego overshadowed Frida almost all his lifetime. And she knew her worth, she knew her talent, and but she felt entrapped. And this is a kind of a wedding dress she's wearing with flowers and all, but it's like a nun's habit also. And you can see it's, it's a kind of a web that entraps her. So uh, this is her, she says exactly that. This is my thoughts about Diego. Here again, you have Diego sort of stamped on a forehead, like a third eye. So. And oh, another very important fact is that um, Freda never for once, you know, uh, or maybe a couple of paintings, she uh, uh, she envisages herself as purely feminine. But then there's always a kind of uh, an ambiguous sexuality, uh, which is brought up in you know, Freda's paintings. People have actually worked on it. She has a mustache and she has, a, a, you know, eyebrows. Uh, uh, like joining together in the middle of the temple. And uh, she, she uh, in fact, uh, in many paintings, you can actually see her as a dual uh, nature. You have her heart, in fact, painted out. And uh, you have this, uh, this wild animal symbolism. Okay. This joining eyebrows and self-portraits. Uh, in fact, she has painted around 55 self-portraits. And she also has this thorny uh, crown. For Christ, it was on his head. For her, it's um, on her neck. So it's kind of, perhaps it's a marriage, perhaps it's a gender, perhaps it's everything. And she, her mustache is like very prominent in almost all the paintings. And she's done it deliberately because she somehow she felt quite fluid about her sexuality, her body as such. Um, and this animal uh, imagery and her, uh, you know, oneness with nature were all um, quite prominent. This is up soon after her spinal operation and for everything. And here is her Pieta, her, you know, she's like reworking on Pieta out here and she's holding uh, Rivera, but uh, Rivera is not very happy about it. Neither is she happy about it, but then she has this uh, feeling of, uh, you know, protecting him, you know, securing him to her body. So there is this kind of um, uh, paradoxical relationship, uh, love-hate, which was happening all the way. And um, sort of a disabled Frida painting again and again. Then Amrita Sharg is somebody who should take a look from the Indian scenario as well. So she was... Uh, famous for her self-portraits and Hungarian portraits and in the nationalistic period she um, uh, she uh, got a lot of uh, prominence because she in fact uh, like Freda she also weaved a lot of indigenous styles for example uh, initially you know she painted uh, the western way you can see a lot of uh, 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 impressionistic mark on her uh, but then later, she, you can see that she had adapted a lot of indigenous Indian styles into her paintings, and they, those became very famous. And here is Mangala, by whom I was actually talking about. And her paintings, which are extended, which are available to us, is 
like with this particular famous painting of Ravi Varma, which was actually painted by her, this Krishna, and there's another famous painting I, which I really like. It's very condescending, patronizing, but there's also uh, something very naturalistic and realistic about it. And it's called Charity. Guys, sorry for the interruption. It was an amazing account of the history of art from the margins. I hope she'll be back soon. Sorry I, sorry, I went offline again. So uh, I'm sure there are private collections of lots of her Mangala Bai's paintings. Uh, I'm sure one day or the other, they'll be accessible to uh, the public. And I just want you to see we a few more. PowerPoint, PowerPoint oh, I mean screen. PowerPoint, sorry, 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 sorry. Where is it? One second. Now we can see, right? Yes, yes. Um, then you yeah, there are a few Malayali painters uh, I would like you to introduce. Uh, I was searching for transgender paintings and painters in Kerala, artists in Kerala, uh, but for body uh, art, you know, uh, and uh, you know, don't have many. Uh, transgender artists still now who've actually come to the mainstream they still uh, remain in the margins but Renju Ranjita the makeup artist you know she is like uh, one of those uh, artists who, who've actually come into uh, the mainstream uh, especially in bridal makeup and uh, body makeover uh, which can be which is considered to be art for part of art Sanjita Shankar is famous for her performance art. You know, she has, in fact, made her own idiomatic impressions uh, in, in the art scenario in the present world. Um, it was very difficult for her because she also, in fact, suffered a, uh, quite a lot of patriarchal setbacks, you know, when she was painting and in the beginning of her career, she had a, a very difficult marriage and uh, she lost a lot, a lot of money. And she it took a lot of time for her to, in fact, establish herself as a woman artist. So I had asked around uh, many women artists, like, how is it like that uh, in, 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 in uh, Kerala's art scenario, especially? And they say that, you know, it's like for a woman, you no, know, it's absolutely very, very difficult. And now, uh, thanks to Kochin Binale and all, a uh, few women are accepted. And these women, as you can see that, they, they, they are basically academic artists, the ones who actually gone to fine arts schools and who've learned their fine arts technically, uh, and uh, they had the degrees. Only then they're accepted into the artistic canon. Uh, they just cannot walk in uh, due to their talent or anything like that. So even now it's a difficult thing. Uh, so very, very, very recently, there was a big, huge controversy among the artists, women artists. Uh, like some artists were uh, invited uh, to, uh, to a camp. Uh, so a lot of camps happen and camps are also places, you know, um, um, where a lot of talent is exhibited. But these are also places that I have been told uh, a lot of discrimination, sexual advances also happen. All right. Uh, a lot of favors are asked, uh, asked and uh, things like that. So uh, Devi Panikkar. So the recent controversy was that uh, they were, the women artists were asked uh, to attend a ca camp and some of them, when they went there, they were asked to paint Savarkar. And a lot of them, you know, just walked off from there, say that it's not possible. So now uh, there is also, uh, you know, the, the equal uh, kind of um, pressure from the right wing to, uh, to assimilate artists into their fold as well. 
Um, of course, a lot of money is like thrown up around, but uh, there's a lot of resistance to this kind of assimilation too. So Rati Devi Panikar is another painter who is like, who was based in Trishur. Um, uh, like uh, her paintings have a lot of uh, different themes, but she's an animal lover and there's plenty of animals and, uh, you know, uh, there's plenty of animal love that you can see in, see in her paintings. And so, so Shosha Joseph is another painter. In fact, uh, she paints with muted colors. She's known all over the world, in fact. And this is a mean chatti. Um, it's different kinds of fish and different kinds of fish curries that women have to. So a lot of domestic life and domestic uh, representations of mean chatti. Siji, Siji R. Krishnan, uh, she took her degree are uh, in fine arts from the University of Hyderabad. She was my junior there. And uh, I own a painting of Siji. Uh, I didn't know that she's going to, we all knew that she's like uh, very talented, but now she's famous all over the world. She has taken residencies all over the world and she's painted extensively. And what's actually famous, uh, she, she used to paint um, in uh, natural, uh, uh, you know, surfaces like handmade paper and uh, she used to paint uh, people uh, what was so spectacular about her painting is, is that her paintings of her father her mother passed away quite early and uh, her father was the one who uh, brought all the kids up and in all her father paintings you know she has painted her father with breasts and the two ripe fruit like breasts where you know there is also the pain of uh, breastfeeding, which is actually written into the, the cobweb. Now, uh, Siji is actually moved from this all watercolor, from moved from watercolor to oil paintings. Jalaja is another remarkable painter um, who, in fact, uh, paints crowds. She's a crowd painter. You know, she paints all kinds of crowds. She paints uh, tourism into being, and uh, she paints different kinds of people. And there's a tug of war. Tug of war between, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who really want to be take to be photographed. This is this is the way you know people, uh, in fact, uh, pose for photographs. So again, there's this humor in her paintings. Now, quickly, if I'm given ten minutes, uh, Kalyani, do I have do I have ten minutes? Sure, sure, you can. Okay, I don't want to bore you people because uh, I don't want to give you an overdose of paintings. Uh, like I just want to <laughs> give you the right, give you the in the right uh, amount. Now uh, there's something called pandemic art in the COVID times. Okay, um, now uh, what is so special about? I really like this because it has actually disrupted the entire industry of art, and it has <laughs> in fact throttle the art market, okay? And I'm actually happy about it because auction houses were the power centers. As I've told you, the Sotheby's and Christie's, and they were the ones who chose artists. They were the ones who chose what kind of art had to be, uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, sold. Now, pandemics, in fact, uh, especially Zoom, Zoom cultures, uh, and, uh, Zoom, Google Meet, all kinds of platforms where the public could gather together and talk about different things, uh, disrupted the entire concept of um, middlemen in art. Now the artists, uh, what happened is that, you know, once upon a time when the artists wanted to, in fact, uh, mediate with each other, they always had to have a middleman. So it's like a uh, Bose Krishnamachari would, no, I won't take names. Somebody would uh, introduce somebody. There, there, there are these heads, you know, there are these canonical figures, basically men. Uh, if, if for uh, the Cochin Binale, you have uh, people like Bose Krishnamachari and um, Riyas Komu, and they're the ones who, in fact, make art. Okay, they're the ones who decide who ought to be exhibited and who shouldn't be exhibited. But now what happened during the pandemic times is that thanks to Zoom and thanks to a lot of boredom, thanks to a lot of time in our hands, artists started, you know, making their, you know, coming up to mediate each other and, uh, you know, and platforms like Zoom and uh, Meet, Google Meet and Jitsu and all were so helpful. So they revolutionized art. Suddenly the middlemen became of very little, little significance. The second part was that art galleries shut down. They shut down in real, but virtually they opened altogether. 
See, uh, virtually uh, a lot of art galleries in France and in London, they opened the gates uh, for the public and they were quite astonished to see that. Till one point when the real art galleries were in place, people used to visit, the people who used to visit art galleries were real connoisseurs, uh, tourists or old people who uh, were tourists and they had nothing to do. Or, or art lovers and critics and artists were also there. They, they belonged to the connoisseurs. Uh, or some rich people, you know, like collectors and you know, who really wanted uh, to see art, who got a kick out of art. And now the virtual opening of, um, of art galleries, you know, what happened was that it seems there was so much of a traffic, virtual traffic of youngsters, which was unprecedented. They never expected it. They never expected, you know, young boys and girls and youngsters, you know, rushing into the virtual galleries. And they were so interested in art. That was number two. Number three was that youngsters, housewives, people you know from the margins, people who were not so privileged to attend art classes and prestigious art institutions, they started, uh, you know, attending classes on again, you know, uh, places like Udemy and Masterclass, not Masterclass, Udemy and uh, Domestica. A lot of artistic platforms, I mean, you know, study materials or consortiums uh, started becoming so popular. And everybody was actually attending, I mean, whoever was interested was attending classes. Number four, you were sitting at home, uh, you know, people were in fact doing a lot of recycling. They were experimenting with a lot of domestic things. They were recycling and regenerating things and they were transforming waste altogether. So there was also a kind of an installation which was happening, um, you know, in ordinary people. So uh, the, can the high canons of art, at least for a year, they'll go out re-establish because middlemen will have to live, you know. Art will come back as a huge industry sooner or later. And But what happened was that the middlemen, uh, I mean, uh, art actually uh, traveled, came home and um, it started uh, affecting people, affecting households, uh, youngsters, housewives, um, ordinary people, and everybody started um, experimenting with art. Art became so democratic. So I'll skip a few things out here. These are all history. If you want to do, go into COVID art, uh, if you really like the topic, then definitely you have to speak about Pieta. You have to speak about Hans Holbein because they all are painted during pandemics, during the plague times. Hans Holbein, who painted his ambassadors, he died of plague. Um, so, uh, and then of course, you know, you have to talk about Bruegel. I'm not going into all these things. Um, now, uh, of course, here you have Edward Munch, he had a Spanish flu, of course he recovered, but then not everyone was actually, this is Edward Shail, his family, he in fact died of uh, Spanish flu, and this is like, uh, you have a laboratory where uh, there's a plague prevention program going on, and this is an AIDS patient, uh, his final moments in photography, so pandemics, but then art during COVID times was revolutionary because it actually came out of the art galleries and it just became so resplendent in the streets. So you had it everywhere, um, you know, and there was a kind of message in all kinds of art. It was instructive. It was pedagogic in nature. They were saying, okay, if you want to kiss, go ahead and love, but then wear your mask. And life also became like that. People you know, that kind of proximity. But the physical proximity was actually measured with care. And uh, all kinds of, you know, youngsters, children, everybody started uh, making art and instructional art, uh, you know, which actually spoke about homes and domesticity for the long time and then washing hands and viruses. And for the first time in history, I mean, maybe not for the first time, but in 20th century, you know, we exactly knew what cost the virus. I think in, except in India, uh, the rest of the world had moved away from, because of, thanks to science, they had moved away from all those notions about God being furious and punishing us. You know, uh, in, during the Renaissance time, during the plague, the Black Death times of the Renaissance, it happened thrice. Uh, Europe was full of fear because they didn't know what was happening during the plague times and they thought it was God's anger, God's wrath that is actually raining upon all human beings uh, alike. Uh, Bruegel was one of those people who, in fact, painted that kind of uh, that kind of uh, 
uh, God's wrath, uh, devastating people. Uh, but we uh, knew what was cause. Except for us, I think uh, we, of course, cl clanged uh, not bottles, plates, and little lamps. No, nothing wrong with lighting lamps. But then uh, that th those kinds of stuff had actually become redundant in Europe and uh, Africa and America. And all. But Italy, of course, they lit lamps. But it was not to dispel the virus. They knew that you cannot kill the virus. But here, a lot of people, you know, they believe that the sounds and can actually uh, become vibrations and kill viruses and things like that. People really gave a kind of pseudo scientific touch. That was the thing. There's nothing wrong in, you know, ringing the bell or lighting a lamp. It's all very auspicious and nice, positive, but then giving it a pseudo scientific touch uh, was a bit dangerous. And uh, I think Europe had actually given it up, you know, maybe uh, over 200 years back. You know, uh, Uh, yeah, we can see you, <laughs> but uh, no screen again. Okay, okay, here, okay. Thanks for reminding. Because I, because I can see the screen. I was under the. I mean, I just forgot about it. Uh, so all kinds of art was like being produced, and people were not embarrassed to have popular kitsch art. The New York Times and a lot of, uh, you know, well-known magazines, they even encouraged uh, COVID art uh, photography and COVID art uh, exhibitions. And uh, people, and this is this boy, yeah, he in fact, uh, so, you know, adapted Ravi Verma's paintings and he made it quite instructional and pedagogic in nature, Rahul B. Matthew. So there was plenty of activism also going on in art. So activism is the main key. This is another point that I really wanted to do. And this is a COVID mural in Hong Kong and street art. In fact, it produced a lot of carnivalesque. Uh, yeah, he's a super uh, woman out here, you know. Suddenly super uh, men and women, uh, we had a different meaning altogether. We had health workers with super men and women. Um, um, and of course, there was a lot of political satire. Uh, Trump and uh, the Chinese premier were made part of left, right, and center. And uh, here is Trump as the virus. Okay. Um, and old paintings were readapted and given different meaning altogether, COVID meaning altogether. And somebody whom you should actually uh, be on the watch out is Bunksy. So Bunksy was, uh, Bunksy is like, Nobody knows who is it, who it is. Okay, he 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 uh, is an artist in the UK. He's a uh, war, uh, he um, uh, he's a uh, this thing um, street artist, um, and nobody knows who he is. He paints um, overnight and he leaves. The next day, you have a spectacle right in front of you. So this is Vermeer's the girl with the diamond, uh, with the pearl earring. So this is a girl with a mask. Vermeer's famous paintings, adaptations taken. So Bunksy had also, Bunksy and his pals, no, though nobody knows him. But of course, he has a middleman. He gets lots and lots of money. You know, uh, now he is, uh, his street art like displayed in almost uh, all famous galleries. And uh, he gets a lot of money for that. And here's this, um, um, famous painting, okay? He had also opened this Instagram account where anybody could in fact send in your COVID artwork. And that particular Instagram handle had millions and millions of followers and people were all making art. They were all producing art like never before. It was a mass production. Suddenly they went very famous artists. Everybody was like, like capable of making art. So there was never such a democratizing kind of move, moment in artistic history. Um, now, I am so uh, high about it. Of course, you know, only when I analyze it a couple of years later, then I'll be able to see the undercurrents of it. But then right from the margins, everybody was talking to the center. And the margins were 
Dickens in the center. And here you have Bunsey's very famous painting, which was painted in the University Hospital Southampton one night. And here it is like, it's called the superheroes. Suddenly, uh, the superhero is not Superman, but a health worker. And she, he had also actually uh, put all his super Batman and other superheroes in the garbage bin. So even a child, you know, knew the importance of science. And, you know, everybody, uh, if you look at pandemic arts in, in the Renaissance time, you know, there was plenty of God. You know, God was actually raining wrath from all sides, you know, and was punishing people left, right, and center. But here we knew um, uh, we were all looking forward to, to the vaccine at that time. And they were laughing at uh, political leaders who were stupid. Uh, we were also regaling the political leaders like uh, the New Zealand prime, uh, prime minister and all uh, uh, for the kind of uh, uh, for the kind of support uh, that especially women leaders, you know, proved the metal during uh, this particular time. And here you are, and here you have the the French kiss of the the Chinese premier and the American, the American president. And there was this huge, uh, you know, fight for, you know, during, uh, people hoarded uh, toilet papers and you know what really happened. So the Golem, the Lord of the Rings, you know, you have the uh, Golem holding rolls and rolls of toilet paper and recycled art was there, recycled masks were there, and readaptation of Mona Lisa. The latest Mona Lisa that I had seen is that Mona Lisa is getting vaccinated. I couldn't get the picture. And you have, you know, uh, uh, the, the creation behind it. And here in India also, they were having a gala time. Uh, I mean, uh, not the migrant laborers, but the artists, in fact, you know, they were um, representing the Right to the migrant laborers at the time of COVID, where lots and lots of them, lakhs of them, had to vacate the city and they walked home. So, and I would also like to show Washington Post, you know, uh, they in fact uh, advertised for uh, COVID art and, you know, they got from all over the world, from Germany, England, Guatemala, all places. And people, in fact, chose all kinds of materials. They did not use paint alone. They used a lot of installations. They used oil. They liked, used acrylic. They used uh, watercolors. They used flowers. They used cinder blocks. They used dryers. They sheet, used sheet, hot glue, all kinds of stationery, all kinds of junk, all, all kinds of recyclable materials were used during COVID times. Um, so um, in India, you know, economically, the artists, uh, especially not very famous ones, had a very tough time. But I also know a couple of uh, people who started taking classes over Zoom. And um, I know a special artistic art, artist friend of mine who, in fact, became quite uh, popular on Zoom as an art teacher. And uh, he's now an established artist. Now, nowhere in the academic artistic world was he ever given entry. But then he established himself. He didn't want the help of any of those people during the COVID times. Okay. Um, so uh, here you can see some of the paintings. And, uh, in the Washington Post, it came the Washington Post, all kinds of people, you know, they talked about lo uh, lockdown, they talked about isolation, they talked about separation, they talked about, uh, when they talked about separation, they also found that kind of proximity, closeness, you know, suddenly, you know, people uh, wear into each other, it seems, you know, for the pandemic times, lockdown times gave a lot of, opened a lot of opportunities, I know a lot of people who became pregnant during that time, uh, cooped up at home, and that's wonderful. And I know a lot of people who had a lot of extramarital affairs and a lot of fun. Um, so it's like, uh, you know, there was polyamory, there was armory, there, there was isolation, there was sadness, there were, there were, it, it was so mixed. So everything came together unexpectedly. And there was also a lot of financial constraint. Um, of course, uh, knowledge capital helped, you know, artistic knowledge capital or, uh, you know, academic knowledge capital helped a lot. You know, people were teaching and taking uh, lessons, etc. But then this was also uh, some kind of a, 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 an era, a period that the world had never ever in this particular century witnessed. And of course, the artist uh, definitely looked at it from a different point of view altogether. And everybody was into art. And here you have trash cans and you're making art of art out of trash cans. And of course, you know, the epidemic here, the pandemic times also uh, gave us a taste of uh, taste of the margins, I would say. Gave us a taste of uh, uh, how mainstream 
arts world or the entire art industry and art market could be toppled in just one day. That is the day when the lockdown began. So uh, thank you so much. It was pretty long, I know, and um, had lots of material. It's basically because I really get excited <laughs> when I talk about art. So uh, pardon me for this real, real long lecture. Uh, now, if you have any questions or anything, I'll be very glad to. If I know, I'll be very glad to answer. Thank you, Bhavi. It was a very uh, exhaustive, physically exhaustive for you, I'm sure. <laughs> That's because <laughs> I don't have a fan of it. For us. <laughs> and sorry, a, but it, sorry. Uh, no, no, it was lovely. <laughs> it was so comprehensive and absolutely brilliant and because we are streaming on live uh, streaming live on youtube they can watch it again and oh dear i i, I wish uh, i know i it didn't register or else i would have been conscious of it it was beautiful <laughs> and uh, before we start with the questions there was a thought that was wrangling in my mind from the beginning uh, okay. when you asked about transgender activists <laughs> uh, obviously most of us do not know any transgender i mean uh, artist um, but I was thinking that the transgender people uh, break the boundaries of art and they do a lot of, uh, they, they themselves are like art forms, uh, you know, like using their yes, body as yes, the yes, canvas. Yes. Yeah, body I was, art is. Mm -hmm. I was, no, even the, just the way they dress up and yeah. uh, come out yes. in the society. I was thinking of Lakshmi Nara and Tripathi as a case in point. Ah, and, yes, yes. And mm -hmm. so many no, of them. Uh, but, uh, I made a huge mistake, okay, during the COVID times, you know, uh, transgender art was also quite, from the margins, mean, it meant uh, from everywhere. Uh, only that, you know, uh, there are a couple of slides there uh, of transgender artists, but not Indians. Uh, I'm sure Indian artistry, it's like uh, they themselves become art, right? Uh, but then in uh, this thing, uh, uh, you know, uh, in many of the uh, platforms like uh, Instagram and all, I have uh, a friend too, who, who in fact, who is actually not a transgender, but like he's an activist, a GBT act activist, and he himself did a lot of performance arts, art, uh, you know, showcasing that light. So uh, it, 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 it became prominent during the COVID times. And it was out of my laziness. I did not, in fact, uh, look at it, but surely it, it is definitely there. A couple of slides are also there. Yeah, which, you know, I can send it to you if you want to take a look. Yeah. So uh, participants, would you like to uh, share some uh, comments or views or ask her a few questions? Um, can I switch on the fan now? If you don't oh, sure, sure, sure. I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no please. Problem. Okay. What do you think of the latest? Somebody is asking, Safa Tahasan is asking, what do you think of the latest developments in NFT art? People selling his art for millions of dollars through blockchain markets. Um, see, uh, what uh, the recent trends show us is that uh, blockchain markets and internet markets and even art galleries, even uh, places like South Southbees and Christie's and all have actually suffered a kind of setback during this one year. Before it was quite prominent. Millions and millions of dollars were transacted. You know, uh, art forms were really, really hyped. Uh, but then uh, COVID uh, art, in fact, uh, changed the entire uh, there was, it was a kind of a paradigm shift that actually happened during this time. The entire lingo of uh, artistic uh, uh, transactions, artist, art market as such, uh, changed altogether. And um, uh, this kind of uh, digitalization of art also kind of democratized. It brought down the prices of art. Uh, uh, and it, uh, as people started imitating left, right, and center, adaptation started coming, and people didn't know what, where exactly uh, the original is, or where exactly the duplicates are. Um, uh, so uh, this kind of multiplicity, or the dynamism of art, 
um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, like especially Instagram, Instagram has really popularized and made ordinary, I mean, made artists of ordinary people, I would say. Okay, uh, so uh, this kind of uh, the huge uh, monetary deals in the art industry, uh, at least for the time being, is a kind of break. I'm sure this is, I mean, there'll uh, they'll be newer ways to find out, uh, you know, uh, this kind of transactions of millions of dollars will be resumed sooner or later. But this was a major rupture uh, uh, in art market as such. So um, uh, even uh, not just people, uh, even Bangsi he sells, though he's a street artist, um, he's a subversive artist, he's a, uh, nobody knows who exactly he is. Some people say he's black, some people say he's white. Nobody knows, but he also sells his art for huge amounts of money uh, because, like, um, at that you know, to be a, an established artist, you have to actually sell uh, in millions and millions of dollars. So, Bangsi also, you know, even during the time of this blockchain market uh, period, uh, Bangsi had, this, uh, you know, had subverted the entire thing uh, when he, uh, he had, in fact, uh, at Lloyd's, I think, um, uh, he, he uh, at Lloyd's, at his, uh, he, uh, he displayed one of his uh, paintings and he said that uh, this is the price. Um, and of course, when you take the painting off, uh, it will disintegrate. People really did not believe in it. And there were a few takers for it. It was sold for millions and millions of dollars. The moment was actually taken off the wall. The painting really disintegrated. So, uh, uh, so even during the time uh, when art market was in fact flourishing, uh, people like Bansi, uh, a lot of street artists were also in fact uh, supporting the entire thing, questioning the kind of uh, money that is involved uh, by making art less and less valuable. I think that this is like one of my uh, artist friends who said, artist, artist, artist artists, nothing but part. So this kind of uh, uh, an irreverence definitely was there even during that time. But then during the COVID times, you know, it became very, very prominent. And it'll take a while uh, for, uh, you know, the digital market and the art market to take over and uh, run it in the older fashion. It's fascinating, this transition from fine arts to public art, isn't it? Yes, it, it is fascinating. So many and people are already doing is, research on that, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. And uh, plenty of researchable material. Because, see, uh, even uh, you know, if you look at your own friend circle, suddenly you have uh, people recycling the bottles and uh, you know making something new or making culinary arts. So suddenly people found a lot of uh, dynamism and possibility in art. And they knew that, and it's like just not meant for artistic gallery because you have the digital platforms uh, which are stronger, uh, which are more accessible to the public, to the entire world. Suddenly, there were no, uh, you know, boundaries of nations and places and spaces uh, that were uh, limiting them. Uh, so that kind of accessibility and that kind of publicity uh, and democratization really helped a lot of artists. And especially for women, you know, this had been uh, particularly uh, uh, had been particularly kind of exciting a time because I have seen bottle art. At least, you know, uh, a lot of people were doing bottle art, and they were, you know, when you research it, I'm sure you know you can find a lot of um, very unique trends out there. Very true. You you must be really exhausted and. Uh... Are there any more questions? If not, we'll call it a day. This is on YouTube, so I'm sure thousands of people will be watching it very soon, and it's going to generate a lot of discussions and new ideas. Uh, it's it's like a spark that we have given so much research as possible in this area. I'm so glad that you gave us such an exhaustive, comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much, Mabida. Um, thank you. So much, Dr. Kalyani. Yeah. My own value for giving me the opportunity, and I'm so glad. Uh, uh, I've been actually talking about it for quite some time. I'm so glad to talk about it again, and uh, you know that that actually made it quite exhaustive. But I'm sure you know uh, you 
a lot of you will be looking at art uh, you know in a different manner altogether so this uh, for anybody who's new here today this is conducted by the cultural studies forum which is an open platform just that just a few ordinary people have started they are researchers interested in cultural studies we will be organizing um, a lot of public lectures like this uh, and i hope all of you including babi you would all uh, support us and uh, come together again for such interesting deliberations So thank you very much. Hope to see you all thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you.